All right, we are back. So for the exciting conclusion, our last section on web programming, which I thought we'd use as a, a general term to capture a few remaining topics. So at the end of the day, we'll actually do a little bit of hands-on web programming uh, with a language called JavaScript. And I think we'll take a look at something related to images and discovering something secretly hidden in an image, and also take a look at the Google Maps API application programming interface as something representative of the type of software that's increasingly and freely available today. But why don't we take a look at an ingredient to this world that we've kind of been taking for granted exists for some time, a database. For the past day and a half, we've assumed that we have access to a database. But what problem does a database solve? What does it do for us? What is it? Holds all the information. OK. And what kinds of information might you put in it? Any information you put in it, you'll get back. That is true. And like on a typical web-based site or web application, what kinds of information specifically might you put in? Users. So and what's a user? OK, registered user of the site. And what does it mean to store users' information? Like, what composes a user? A user has what? Yeah, personal data. And I like that. Let's be more precise. So a user typically has a name. What else might a user have? An address. OK. <laughs> so first name, last name. That's good. Actually, let's fix that, because that's going to open up an opportunity for discussion still further. First name, last name, gender. An ID of some sort. What else? I heard something else before, too. An email. Postal address. All right. So let's pause there and now consider not what we're storing in the database, but and not why, since it's perhaps obvious that once you register a user, you want to remember them for some time. You don't want it to just be stored in RAM and be forgotten. So let's focus on the how. It turns out that in the world of databases, there's at least two types these days, uh, something called a uh, SQL database, structured query language, or uh, cutely named NoSQL, which is not SQL. Um, and the latter is an example of what might be called an object-oriented or an object store, a database that stores objects and not, excuse me, as we'll soon see, rows. So we'll focus for just a moment on the first of these, namely, a SQL database, if only because it's so familiar already to anyone who's used Excel or Google, uh, Google Sheets or uh, Apple Numbers or any standard spreadsheet program, or equivalently or more sophisticatedly, something like Microsoft Access or Oracle or MySQL or PostgreSQL, all of which are product names for implementations of the following idea. A relational database is simply something that has rows and columns. And by rows and columns, I literally mean something like this. So where we might have the name of a field and its type over here. And actually, let me now start to map these. So in other words, let's move into, actually, I don't know why I drew a separate chart. Let's keep this simple. We have right here the beginnings of our table, where this is the name of the field, and this is the data type. And by type, I mean the following. Is it a number? Is it a string, a short string like a word? Is it a paragraph? Is it binary data like an image? And let's just tease this apart for just a moment. So uh, first name, number, string, large chunk of text. Sorry. Yeah, so string. And you know what? In a database context, we'll typically call this uh, char field. I'll just say char for now, but we're going to refine this in a moment, character field. Uh, for last name's probably the same. Gender? Male or female. So it could be a char field. It could be either quote unquote male or quote unquote female. Or it could be M or F. If you want to be more inclusive, you might need a third value or some kind of other field altogether. And so you could use true false. You could, right, the fields could be called male, and then you could say true or false, but that doesn't necessarily capture all of the information you might want. So it turns out there's another type of field that might be useful here in a typical database called an enum, where it is a character field, but you, the designer, get to enumerate the possible values, like quote unquote male, quote unquote female, and so forth, so that whatever value is in your database 
is indeed character based, but it has to be one of those values. We probably wouldn't want an enum for first name or last name, otherwise we would have to enumerate as the name derives from literally every possible first name and last name. Okay, so uh, ID, what should an ID be? Yeah, so maybe a number. So let's let's stick with that for now. Number. And by number, number's a little a little too broad now. For the end of the second day, I feel like we should be a little more precise. Number could mean like it could be something like 1.236. And that's probably not what we mean by an ID. What do we mean probably mean by an ID? A lot. Oh, okay. So maybe it's not even a number. Maybe it's actually a, a, a unique identifier that's a string, like a username. So absolutely, could be. I think someone probably meant numeric though, so let's stay with that. What kind of number? What's a more precise? An integer. So a number like 0, 1, 2, 3. So we'll call this an integer. And even then, I could be nitpicky and say, mm, it's not really just a general integer you want. You probably don't want negative values just because. It just feels weird. You probably want positive integers. So you can also express that in a database. But for now, we'll say integer. Email. This is probably just a what? It's an email, but that's also characters, right? It just has a funky character, like an at symbol or something else, but it's still a character field. And postal address? And character field. So that's a nice beginning, but let's be a little more precise now. So it turns out that in a database, you often have a choice over more refined versions of these things. In fact, in a typical SQL database, SQL, or more generally relational database, databases with rows and columns, you often get to specify not only the type of the field, but let me make some room here, but also the length. So how long is a first name? I think D-A-V-I-D. -D. OK, got it. I probably just offended like half of the people in the room, <laughs> right? Since your names are longer than five letters. So five seems a little selfish and naive. So what's a better value? Ten. Ten. All right. And I think we're OK in the room. Thirteen? Thirty? Why don't I take the approach of earlier when we were talking about arrays and memory? Why don't I just say like a thousand? No one's name is going to be longer than a thousand. Push back. Yeah, it's, it's wasteful, right? Especially if most names are only 5 or 10 or 15 characters. That's very wasteful. So you know what? This is kind of a hard question. Now, we could certainly like analyze English and any other language's names and figure out, well, what is the average? Average doesn't really help us. What's the max is probably what we really want. But it turns out we even have some choice over the type here. In a typical SQL database, you have something called a char field and also a var char. V-A-R, for variable char field. And the difference is this. A char field, you, the designer, have to specify in advance the exact length of the field. So maybe first name, uh, like 20, feels kind of safe. Might have to do some Googling to see if that's actually safe enough. Um, there's probably a name with 21 characters. But for now, suppose 20 is safe. A char field would imply in a database that you are using 20 and always 20 characters. Now, if it's just D-A-V-I-D, 15 of those are just going to be blank characters, but you're still using all 20 bytes. A varchar field, by contrast, means the string should be up to 20 characters, but if it's only five, you're only going to use five, or maybe six for like a special value at the end, like that zero we discussed that signifies the end of a, a character sequence in, the, in memory. So when do you think you might choose char versus varchar, given that trade-off. Char uses that many characters. Varchar uses no more than that many characters. OK, when you know the length of the string, it's pretty compelling to just use char, because if you know it, just put it down. And maybe that's true for like a zip code, like oh, in the US at least, 02138. It's always going to be five characters until you add the, like, the dash four. But you might have some values for which you always know the length, or maybe state symbols like NY for New York, MA for Massachusetts in the US. Maybe you do have some situations where that's totally reasonable. But by that logic, I, you, why are we even overthinking this? Why don't we just use varchar? And then we'll just always use two characters anyway, or always use five characters anyway. Why not just say varchar for everything by that logic? There must be a catch. 
could write something wrong. So that is true, but even then, they can't use more memory than I allocate. I still have the final say over the length, so they can't accidentally make that mistake, but a good thought. It's more subtle, but it's very related to our discussion, actually, of arrays and linked lists earlier. It turns out that a database, if it knows that all of the values are of a fixed length, even if some of those values are blank, sort of aesthetically blank, the AVID and then 15 blanks, it turns out that if every field is the same length, much like an array had all of its stuff back to back to back to back so that you could just plus one to get to the next value, same idea in a database table, if all of your character strings are the same length, you have what's called random access. If the, all the strings are of length 20, you don't just do plus one, you just do plus 20, plus 20, plus 20, plus 20, and you can very rapidly scroll through or search through all of your data. A variable char field, by contrast, doesn't always have 20 characters. It might have 20, and then 15, and then 19, and then 10. And so if you want to search through it, you can't just blindly add 20 bytes to get to the next one. You literally have to search through, because like the edge of the, the data structure, if you will, is ragged. It kind of goes in and out based on the actual length of the string. So when you know the length, as Kareem says, use a char field, because you gain that efficiency of being able to search through it faster when you're looking for data. Otherwise, use a variable. Unfortunately, I have no good answer to how long the name should be. But for something like a name, I would say a var char is common because we don't. It's not going to be a fixed length for everyone. Twenty. I don't know. Twenty feels a little generous. Uh, feel a little tight. Let's just say fifty. Fifty. You don't. It doesn't really cost you that much more to say fifty instead of forty. But at some point, you need to make a judgment call. Very common, frankly, for historical reasons even though it's excessive, is to say 255 because some time ago in popular database systems like MySQL, a free open source tool that a lot of companies like even Facebook use, this was like the maximum default. So people just went with it. So not unreasonable, but we'll use a little more intuition and say, sure, 50, but that's probably a little excessive. Gender, I do like enum. And so we can therefore enumerate uh, male or female, or maybe more efficiently, M or F or some other symbology. But enum feels like a good choice there. To be clear, gender could just be a varchar. And we could just all agree, as nice people, to always put the same values there, male or female or whatnot. But the problem then is that we could make a mistake, as Arbo proposed earlier in a different context. If we make a mistake, we could get incorrect values in our database. So what's nice about databases like Oracle and MySQL and others is that you have this last layer of defense where your DBA, database administrator, whoever's designing this table like we are verbally, could put into place an enum that protects against that by specifying male, female, and so no one else, no programmer can accidentally insert any other value. So this would be a good thing. This is a feature. So an ID, assuming a numeric ID, it probably should be a positive integer. And we sometimes do have uh, opportunity to discuss length. You wouldn't typically specify a number here. You would instead specify this is a, uh, an int or a big int, as they're typically called. Um, but typically, an integer would be, let's say, four bytes. And if it's four bytes, that's how many bits? Yep, 32 bits. So how many users can we have in our database if they all have an ID and this ID has to be unique? 32 bits means we have patterns of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So how many different patterns of zeros and ones can you have if they're 32? That's the same thing as asking what's 2 to the 32? It's a big number that I can't quite get right, but I know it's roughly 4 billion. So this means your database table can have 4 billion users, and that's it. So this is an interesting design implication. A decent number of companies have decided, maybe not so much for their users table, because having 4 billion users is a rare problem. This is sort of a Facebook style problem, not a typical company problem. But maybe if you have like transaction logs or some kind of data that constantly gets written to your database that absolutely could have billions and billions of rows, and you use an integer for it, what's going to happen as soon as you get to row number 4 billion, and then you try to insert the 4 billionth and 1, so to speak. I'm simplifying the numbers a bit. You kind of, you cut back. I mean, you kind of, you have to handle it somehow. And what a computer would typically do, think about it even from this morning, if you have a 4-bit four four value, like 1111, which, just to tie the morning together to the afternoon, what does this number represent in binary? OK, we'll make it easier. What does this number represent in binary? 
OK, we'll make it easier. What does this represent in binary? Three. OK, because we have the ones column. <laughs> OK, we have the ones column and the twos column. So suppose that indeed our infield weren't 32 bits, but it were two bits. We can count from user number 0, 1, 2, 3. And then we're kind of back to user 0, 0 again. So this is what typically happens. If you've ever heard the expression, probably haven't, but if you have, integer overflow, where you keep flipping all of your bits to be the biggest possible values, and then you're kind of you're out of bits, what would typically happen? Why do I say 0, 0? Well, this is 3. How do I represent 4? How do I represent the number 4 in binary? One, yeah, and don't say 100 per se, because it has the wrong connotation, but 100. Zero, zero. So that number 100 zero, zero is indeed correct, but if you only have two bits, what have you really done? You've rolled over to 0, 0. And indeed, that's what would happen. Actually, you can think about this more familiarly. If you recall, what, 16 years ago, the world was supposed to end um, when the Y2K problem happened. Why was that? Well, most computers, for reasonable decisions were storing numbers like the year 1975 or the year 1999 by just using two digits in the computer's memory. So of course, what happens when you get to the year 2000? You go to this, or rather, yeah, so you go to two, the year 2000. But if you're only using two digits, it looks like the year 00, zero and so you've rolled over. And this is why a lot of systems needed to be updated at the time. Um, so with that said, <laughs> companies like Facebook run up against this. So the only way to handle this situation, frankly, is to anticipate it. Or the cleanest way to handle this situation is to anticipate it so you don't have to make changes later. So instead of 8 bytes, you know what? I'm going to be forward thinking here, even though it's, it's a little optimistic that we're going to have 4 billion and 1 users on our website. But let's just use 8 bytes or 64 bits, which would generally be called a big integer, <laughs> uh, very technical. Um, and that just means you can have even more digits in your number. But this is an, re uh, this is an important design decision because if you choose a number that has too few bits of expressiveness, you could actually create a bug in your software. All right, so let's wrap up with email and postal address. So email, how long should an email address be? 50, I really have no idea, but it's probably something like that because otherwise no one's going to write you if it gets too long. So 50, let's go with it for now. Postal address. How long should that be? Yeah, and it's not just a zip code, though. Postal address, I heard. So this is like 1 Brattle Square, comma, Cambridge, Mass, comma, 02138. And in fact, let me just pull up a little worksheet here. This feels like it's a missed opportunity. If we have 1 Brattle Square, comma, Cambridge, Mass, 02138, I feel like we can do better than just postal address. Why don't we explode this a little bit? What am I getting at? What should we s instead have for our rows here, perhaps? Yeah, so let's call it uh, street underscore number. And an underscore is just a common way of having what looks like a space, but it's not actually. Uh, street and then uh, city. Sorry? We could do that, line one, line two. Why don't I, we'll keep it simple for now, but that's absolutely an acceptable decision. And then state, and then let's be a little US centric for now and just do zip code, just because it'll lead to an interesting mistake or problem here. So suppose that's now our address. It's a little more annoying that we have all these more fields, but now we can tag things a little better. So now street number probably shouldn't be a char, should it? What should it be? Maybe a, a number, like an integer, again, a big integer? You probably don't live at 4 billion Main Street or anything crazy like that. So integer is probably fine, but has anyone ever lived at an address like 1A Brattle Square or like 1 and a half? Like these things exist, unfortunately. Even if you haven't lived there, there are these anomalies like apartment 1A, 1B, 1C. So you know what? We probably shouldn't go with integer, otherwise we're going to lose some sales. Char field, maybe? So I don't know how long. It's probably not going to be that long, so 10 or something. No one's going to write a longer number, maybe. But again, we should probably give more thought to that. Maybe Google do some research, but we'll go with our guts for now. Streets, char, 50, I don't know, right? Like at some point, no one's going to write it on an envelope, too. So there's probably some upper bounds there. City, same, sure. So char, 
50 states. Let's be, we can be US centric for now. So it could be a list. So kind of a judgment call. Maybe state, it could be like two characters. So, and actually, maybe I kept saying char. I probably mean var char just for some efficiency, but we'll come back to that decision in a moment. Uh, could be a char of length two for state, right? If you know in the US, they have like uh, MA, Massachusetts, NY, New York, NJ, New Jersey, and so forth. So it could be fixed at that, and DC for Washington, DC. But I think, uh, what was it, Olivier, you proposed another approach. Yeah, so it's a little annoying to type in. But an enum might make more sense because this way, at least in the US, you could enumerate, if tediously, but you do it just once in your database and never again have to think about it, all 50 uh, two-digit or two-character codes. So I like enum. Let's stick with that there because it sort of enforces more rigor. And then zip code? I think Andrew had a thought on it. Yeah, five or nine. Let's just keep it simple. We'll just do five for now. But wait, I could just do an integer, right? I could, but you know what? Um, I did this, I made this mistake once in some sense. Years ago, I was migrating from Microsoft Outlook to Gmail. And so Outlook has a way of exporting all of your contacts as an Excel file, like a CSV file, comma separated values file. And I made the mistake, I think, of double clicking it once I downloaded the export to make sure it looked as I expected. I must have hit save or let autosave kick in or something. Because when I then imported it into Gmail, it all worked. But for years, to this day, and I did this five, ten years ago, I'm still finding friends who have addresses that look like this. Why? Took the zero yeah, it took the zero, uh, the uh, zero, well, rather, it took the whole zip code as a number, and therefore it's a leading zero, which means it has no meaning, and so. 2138 seems to be my zip code. And this is frankly is an annoying Excel feature whereby I think by default, even if it's an entirely numeric field, it, uh, rather, even if it's meant to just be text, Microsoft Excel decides, let me be helpful, and oh, I see only numbers, let's treat these as numbers, and it truncates the leading zero. So I swear to God, every couple of months I find an address, and out of a sort of OCD, I go back in and add the zero, even though I never send people letters or anything. But I'm still finding remnants of this. So this is to say, is this a good idea? OK, no, because anyone in Massachusetts in this area is going to have a zero leading them. So let's go with like a char, probably. Uh, five. And here, realize we could use an enum and we could enumerate 10,000 possible zip codes, but that feels like it's probably crossing a line of like benefits if you have to input that much data into your database to protect against something. So char realize you could type in H-E-L-L-O as your zip code, which is not obviously numeric. So there's no way in a typical database to specify only numeric and only five characters long. So we're going to have to do that in code. We're going to have to do that in PHP or, J or Java or whatever language we're using on the server to enforce that kind of constraint. Whew. All right. So any questions just yet? Well, let's make another design decision. It turns out that you also get to choose when designing a SQL database or typical relational database, database where again, relational just means rows and columns. That's how you organize your data. And realize that what this means is I've been misleading in that I'm drawing, this is what's called a schema for a database table. This is like the specifications for the table. But when it comes time to actually store data, and we'll do this just by example here. I'm going to open up Excel because Excel will give me rows and columns, and that's exactly what Oracle and MySQL and other tools will give me. So I'm just going to use it for discussion's sake. Let me go ahead and open up a representative document here, zoom in a bit. So for instance, our headers are now first name, last name, gender, ID, uh, email, street number, street, whoops, street, city, state, just about fits on the screen. So what this means is that when a user first registers for my website, it's going to be something like David. Malin M, let's say one, Malin at harvard.edu. Street number will be like one, Rattle Square, Cambridge, Mass, 02138, and then so forth. So when I say that a relational database or a SQL database is rows and columns, I mean this, that actual data is stored in rows and columns. 
This is just a coincidence that we were talking and I was drawing it out in rows and columns. This is just the schema, the overarching definition. So of these fields here, or equivalently there, which are the fields that you think I'm likely to search on if I'm a user or if I'm the database administrator? Like what fields am I actually going to search on? The name, yeah. So I like the fact that, uh, yeah, email might be pretty common. Uh, and sorry, you said name? So maybe, I don't, and again, we're kind of talking in the abstract. I don't know why you'd be searching for a name, but that feels reasonable if you're searching for a user. State maybe states, sure. ID. And it's a slippery slope, right? Because I could contrive a scenario where maybe my boss has asked me, you know, how many uh, men do we have on our site? How many women do we have on our site? And so at that point, you might want to search on the gender field too and nothing else. So there's a trade off here. Again, there's no right answer, but there is a feature in most SQL databases known as indexing, whereby you, the designer, the database administrator, get to decide in advance which fields the database should optimize for searches on. You could very naively say, optimize this, optimize that, optimize this, optimize that, and this, and the database will do some magical thing underneath the hood and do something in such a way that the next time you search on any of these fields, it will in fact be faster. Like this is possible, it doesn't cancel itself out. But there must be a price paid. If you naively or over enthusiastically say, index all of these fields, so to speak, make them all efficiently searchable, what price are you probably paying? Performance, what do you mean? Well, performance, at least in the context I'm discussing, is better now. That's the definition of indexing. It will make searches faster. So time decreases, so to speak. Space. Space. So again, these are a common trade-off. I can speed up your searches, but it's going to cost you more bytes of space. Why? Well, by default, if we have none of these red stars, none of these indexes, as I'm saying, how do you search for a name in this database? So let's draw our attention to this example. If we have David and Scully and Kareem and Arwa and others in these rows, for instance, so let's do exactly that. So Scully is in here. And then we have Kareem and Arwa and everyone else. If you don't have an index defined, so to speak, the best you can do is linear search. If you search for Arwa, we're not going to be able to jump right to her quickly. We're going to have to start top and go all the way to the bottom, not unlike our original Mike Smith example. If, however, I say, hey, database, index the first name field, then you know what? It's going to do something fancier and support something like binary search. It's probably not binary search per se. Databases tend to use another data structure called uh, B trees, not to be confused with binary trees, that just make it faster to search, something logarithmic in nature. But the price you pay to build up that feature, that data structure in memory, is more bytes. So it might take a, some megabytes, some gigabytes, who knows? It depends on the data. So at some point, you have to decide it's probably not a common case. So what are the actual common cases? If you really had to choose, what might your favorite fields be? Email, and I like email because email in theory should be unique. And so typically when you know in advance that one of your fields is or will be unique, that tends to be a good field to search on because that way when you search for something, you're going to get back one or zero responses and then you're done. You don't have to keep looking for yet others. And so in this case here, Email, so long as you can't register twice with the same email, is a good one. ID, by definition, in the computer science world, if you're talking about an ID, that had better be unique. That's sort of the connotation of ID or identifier. And the rest of these might be, let's call them nice to haves, but not really required. And so in a database, you can specify indexes, but you can be even more precise. You can say, hey, database, make sure that every ID in this table is unique. Don't even let a programmer accidentally put in a duplicate email or a duplicate ID number. So much like enums protect us similarly, you can have those lower level defenses. And so database design in some sense is kind of fun because you do it defensively. You sort of assume that you work with horrible, horrible programmers and you want to put in as many defenses as you can to protect your data, but simultaneously you want to help them perform better by choosing which fields to optimize for. But you can't necessarily do it in a vacuum like we kind of are here. You've got to know what are those common cases being. If the developers are implementing an address book, you might very well want to be able to search on almost every field just by nature of the application. So maybe you spend that additional space. All right. Any questions? On C yeah? Nope. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, so we are talking in a way now that's completely language agnostic. So at, we are talking now about relational databases more generally, or SQL databases more generally. What can a better word to use is can be used by any language. So I can write JavaScript code, C code, C++ code, Java code, Ruby code, all of which talk to a database and execute queries. In fact, that's not a bad segue to an example query. And again, we're not going to go into Java or C++ or any of that anymore. But in SQL, the language to which I keep referring, structured query language, this itself is a programming language, but it's meant to be used for, no surprise, structured query queries. Um, what, by that, I mean this. The way you select data from a MySQL database is you literally type in your program something like uh, select star from users. I am assuming that this table henceforth is called users. I could call it anything we want, but that kind of makes sense. And so select is a very common verb, if you will, in SQL that literally does that. What do you think star means in this context? I'm sorry? Uh, not required, it's more inclusive than that actually. It's the wild card character. Star almost always means anything. So this means, in this case, select everything from the database. So when I say this, I mean give me back every column from my table called users. So give me a result set, as it's called. In other words, give me a copy of this spreadsheet, is what I'm getting at. But if I said select star from users where ID equals 1, how big should my result set be then? Or equivalently, how many rows should I be handed back from the database? Probably just one. If I have indeed treated ID as a unique identifier, and if David has that unique ID, I should get back one and only one row containing all of David's information. If I said this, where ID equals 99, I should get back, in this context, zero rows, at least at the moment. However, if I don't really care about all that information, I could just say, you know what, where does David live? Select, uh, select zip code from users where ID is 1. This will select to me only David's zip code and not the entirety of that row. Why might I do this instead of the star query, the wild card? Yeah, I might, I might only need it. And so performance is again the answer here. Why ask for more information than you need? Because even if it's all right together, you still have to copy that data, it would seem, from the database into your program somehow. And that's just silly if you only need five of those digits, not the entirety of the row. So how do I insert a user? Suppose a user has just registered for the first time. The syntax would usually look like this. Insert into users. And then we would say uh, values. And then we would say values like, let's say, uh, Lauren. Scully, our videographer, writes here. And the next field is gender, so we'll say quote unquote F. Then we have an ID, and I'm going to say, uh, let's pretend she's not actually here, so we'll rewind in the story. So two will be her ID, and then the next field here is her email. So it's going to be like Lauren, Scully, and so forth, and we'll just dot, dot, dot it away from here on. It's just now it'll get a little tedious, but the insert query would ultimately look like that. If I want to get rid of Scully, uh-oh, let's deregister her. She deletes her account. Delete from users where ID equals 2. We'll get rid of Scully. Or I can say update users set, um, let's, say, uh, let's say, what could we change? Suppose she moves, set zip equals 021, oops, that's her current zip, 90210, the only other zip code I know in the world. So, that would change her zip code. Actually, that would not change her zip code. What did I just do? Even though you've, the syntax is probably new. Yeah, I, made, I moved everyone to Beverly Hills, California. So I should actually say where ID equals 2, and so forth. So SQL is all about these kinds of instructions. Select, insert, uh, delete, update with these predicates at the end, where these where clauses, so to speak. And there's a lot more you can do, but it really just boils down to succinctly, if arcanely, expressing what you want the database to do. And then the database will figure out, when you insert Lauren Scully into the database, where to put her in memory so that we can very quickly get her based on her email address or based on her ID number or the like. Yeah, Dan. 
Really good question. Will these scripts change from Microsoft Access to Oracle to MySQL to PostgreSQL? Short answer is it depends. In theory, there is a very significant common uh, subset of SQL that's shared across all of these implementations. However, various manufacturers have added features to their databases to do certain things beyond the scope of these features that might in fact break. So the way developers hedge against this is that rather than writing raw SQL code like I'm writing here, they instead use a library. Um, a common uh, a library that itself is sort of higher level and abstracts away which product you're using and it gives you functions, procedures to call so that you never actually write raw SQL. In theory then, you can change products from Oracle to Microsoft or vice versa or anything else and you literally change nothing about your code. The reality though is you sometimes give up features as a result. You might have chosen a product because it's got these value added on features and you're just now not using them consciously. And sort of anecdotally, most companies tend never to move away from their database. So while this is a nice to have feature, the reality is if you're overhauling your database, you're probably making bunches of other changes anyway that you don't necessarily need to anticipate that. So it's arguably over engineering the problem, but it really depends on the context. But in theory, SQL is shared across these various products. Really good questions. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, so you can think a database is just a server at the end of the day and inside of that server is a whole bunch of tables, rows and columns and when you send a query like this from your program, your, your website written in Java, C, uh, Java, Ruby, Python, whatever, the server is receiving this command and interpreting it in literally the same way we discussed earlier with interpreted languages and then performing some action on zero or more rows and zero or more tables. Exactly, exactly. So the pseudocode for something like that might be this. In your PHP file or your Python file or your Java file, you would have pseudocode or scratch-like blocks as if user visits uh, acme.com slash register for first time, then insert into users and so forth. And we would translate this to more concrete code in the end. But really, we have all the building blocks here, even though we're skipping some of the implementation steps. So let me find fault with what we wonderfully did just a moment ago. You have created a pretty complete table for users. Admittedly, we could implement it in a few different ways. But you have actually led us down a path, and I say you, but I, this is probably my fault, of a fairly inefficient database implementation. It's not normalized. And by normalized, I mean there's going to be over time a significant redundancy and therefore inefficiency, that is, waste of space. Based on only what you see here, can you envision where this waste of space is going to come from over time as more and more users register for your website? What data might become redundant? Ah, why do you mean that? Because I don't know how the user can see it. So probably one user per row or two and two is plain. So you have a bad information. Yeah, and it's let's assume for the purposes of today that that is true. Turns out, and we've learned this the hard way, that is not true. Somehow uh, multiple cities have somehow the same zip code, which breaks this wonderful intuition. But let's suppose that's true, because it's almost always true. So suppose that a zip code is always associated with the same city and state, which is kind of reasonable assumption, but incorrect it turns out, but reasonable assumption for today's purposes. Then suppose that I live in Cambridge, Mass, according to this user's table, and suppose that Lauren Scully lives in Cambridge, Mass, and suppose that Kareem lives in Cambridge, Mass, and, and Arwa lives in Cambridge, Mass, all of us in 02138, why are we remembering Cambridge, Mass, 02138 for all four of us? What should suffice to remember? Just the zip code, just that 02138 exists because you know what we could do? We could get a little fancy here and over here define another table where this is going to be the name, this is going to be the type, this is going to be the length, and henceforth I'm going to call this my cities table. This was called, of course, my users table. 
And so what should I put over here for my cities table, do you think? Yeah. So zip and state and city. And so the type here, we'll say this is going to be a char 5 again, subject to the debate of earlier. This will be an enum, perhaps, like before. And city will be a var char 50. And so now what do I get to erase from this table to eliminate that inefficiency? Nice. State and city go away. So I've now eliminated the potential inefficiency for redundantly remembering Cambridge Mass, Cambridge Mass, Cambridge Mass, Cambridge Mass, which hopefully is never going to change. And even if it does, it's minorly annoying now that I have to change it in multiple rows, whereas here I could just change it in one place. Now what's the trade-off, perhaps? This was super convenient. I had all my data nicely together. But what's clearly the case now? Exactly. And I'm glad you used the word join, because that's actually the keyword in the world of relational databases in SQL. It's an actual word you might type, or at least convey. And in fact, what we now have to do to select David's full information is something like select star from users join cities uh, on, and now I'm going to just move to a second line so that this fits, users.zip equals cities.zip where users.id uh, equals 1. So what's going on? It's, it's ugly looking, but you can kind of read it left to right, top to bottom. Select star from users is the same as before, but it's not from users per se. It's from users join cities. What am I joining those two tables on? Well, apparently, the users tables zip field, and this period is just special syntax to express that idea, and this is the cities tables zip field. I want those two to be equal, but I want to ultimately select only those rows where ID in the users table equals 1, which happened to be mine. And just to be clear, I often, you know, a programmer typically wouldn't hard code something like the number 1, because otherwise the website only supports data, David or the very first user. You would instead do something like uh, ID, where this represents a variable, something that can change over time, similar in spirit to what I said earlier with these kinds of placeholders. But for now, we'll just hard code it as one. And so what does this mean? Well, a nice way to visualize this is that if this hand is the users table and this hand is the zips table, we're sort of finding, and the tips of my fingers are zip over here and the tips of my fingers here are zip, you're kind of interlocking it so that you get back the resulting original table by truly joining the two tables on the common field. And it doesn't have to be zip. It could be most anything else. But zip is nice because, one, it's short. Two, it's always the same length. So there's a real efficiency to what uh, Kareem or what uh, Olivier proposed here with factoring out the zip and RO proposing that we get rid of city and states. So this is the process known as normalization. Any questions on that? Well, let me point out, this is the kind of stuff, even though it's fairly low level, this discussion, that you would think you're sort of getting lost in the weeds. This is a manifestation of ample opportunity for developers to be bad. And in fact, even when we, in courses I've taught, when we've had, for instance, inexperienced undergraduate programmers build websites, at first glance, the websites might look terrific. And they have all of the functionality we requested, like the developers did a good job but they didn't necessarily know enough about database design or they didn't think hard enough about the types of data and the types of users the website was going to have. And we find then six months later after they've graduated or moved on that, damn it, our website is really genuinely slow. And I'm not even talking about having millions or thousands of users. I mean, a few hundred users on campus, all of whom like to, for instance, shop for courses at the same time. They're using that course catalog application I mentioned. And the thing is getting really slow because there were no indexes. There were no red stars, so to speak. Or we hadn't necessarily factored out common data to get some uh, savings of space. And so when vetting a developer or a database person or the like, the kinds of questions to think through is even when reviewing someone's code to say, 
not necessarily look through all of their code, but say, let, let's look through the database tables. What are you storing? And then to say, wait, wait a minute, why are you using an integer? What if we have 4 billion and 1 of these rows? And these kinds of a questions is an opportunity to kind of push back and get a sense of, or if you're not comfortable doing it, having someone more technical ask these questions of whether or not the person really knows their stuff. And this is the kind of stuff, too, that people on the internet who are self-taught maybe learn less frequently because you don't necessarily come across it as much because you can get the database up and running, but unless you've read up on tutorials or been told about database normalization and indexing and performance, these are the kinds of things that are going to hurt you. And you might think, or a bad engineer might say, oh, well, we better pay for a bigger database or a faster database or just throw money at this vertically scale. But not necessarily so. If you go in, and you can go in after the fact and add indexes, and it might take a few hours for the database to build up that new data structure that I alluded to earlier, you can still fix this after the fact. But this is where you start to distinguish good designers from bad designers, not just aesthetically, but performance-wise as well. Any questions? No? So for NoSQL, which was the other type of database to which I alluded earlier, you don't have rows and columns. Instead, you would have something that looks a little more like this. And I'm going to use common syntax. Curly braces happen to be used here quite a lot. You might have something like first name is David. You might have last name is Malin. Quotes. You might have ID is, uh, excuse me, whoops. Uh, ID is 1. Email is mailin at harvard.edu, and I won't bother typing out the rest, and then some other things. In other words, this is a textual representation of what we would generally call an object in a computer program. And an object is generally just a collection of key value pairs. So again, this recurring theme. We saw key value pairs in HTML. We saw key value pairs now in the context of databases. And we saw key value pairs in the context of, I think, a language earlier today keeps coming up. And indeed, that's really what data boils down to, data and metadata, or values and keys, respectively. So a, a non-relational database, something based on objects, where you just clump everything together and put it into memory, would generally be pictured as, or thought of, as this. And I'll leave that kind of now as a sort of a alternative approach. Um, and one isn't necessarily better than the other. Um, in fact, very much in vogue these days are database systems uh, like MongoDB and Redis and a few other such tools freely available, but they're increasingly in vogue partly because they offer additional features over these ta tabular approaches, but also because they're a little easier to use because you don't have to think as hard about a lot of these design decisions. So pluses and minuses. So realize there are options beyond what we just spent time on. So let's do this. Let's transition a little back, back now to web programming so that we kind of conclude today with something that's a little hands-on and filling in some gaps from yesterday. Let me go to this first. So recall that yesterday we had some canonical HTML pages that had initially only HTML and then secondarily had CSS, cascading style sheets. This is a new tag that we didn't see yesterday or dwell on so-called script tag. Turns out, you can actually embed a language called JavaScript in your web page and make your web pages do something. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me go ahead and just borrow this code for a moment. I'm going to go into Cloud9. No need to go there yourselves just yet. And I'm going to call this uh, alert.html. I'm going to paste in my file here. And just to clarify what I've done, let me go to this address and go to alert, and you see the hello world. But this is kind of underwhelming. I want to do something a little different. So I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to go in here, and in between my script tag, say alert, hello world, semicolon. So notice, it's a little sloppy, but I've got HTML, inside of which is a language called JavaScript. And this is what's called a function call, or a procedure call. This is a verb, literally in this case. And I am invoking code functionality that someone else wrote. So that functionality is an alert. So let's go to this page now and click Reload. And now you see a little bit of interactivity. It's kind of old school and ugly. This kind of reminds you of the pop-ups, perhaps, of yesteryear. But it did do something a little more programmatic. So more than that, 
let's do something more interesting. Let me go in here and get rid of this. And I'm going to go ahead and create a form like we did yesterday. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go into google.html, which we started on yesterday, which looked like this, via which we searched for cats. But notice there's kind of a bug in the current version. It works for cats, but suppose that I don't cooperate and I type nothing, and I simply click Submit. I feel, mm, like that's kind of weird behavior. It took me to the real Google, didn't give me an error message. I'd like to tell the user, you need to give us a value. So how might we do this? Well, let me go back into Cloud9, and let me go into the top of my page and add a script tag, like this, where I'm going to type some JavaScript code. And I'm going to do the following. Um, if document.getElement by ID, and recall that we talked about that earlier, that function. What ID do I want to get? I want to get Q, and I'm going to say equals nothing like this. Actually, let me use double quotes just for consistency. Equals nothing. Then alert, please type a query here. So I have what appears to be something like a condition. We've seen this general idea in Scratch. It's like one of those puzzle pieces that looked like this. And what am I saying? Well, down here, notice I'm going to do the following. I'm going to give this form field not only a name of Q, which is what gets passed to Google, but I'm going to give it a local identifier, also called Q. But I could call this anything I want. I'm just going to keep it simple and also call it Q, just for simplicity. And now I'm going to do something a little more. On the form fields here, I'm going to add what's called an event handler. On submit, I want to call a function called validate. All right, this does not exist yet, this word or this verb validate, because what I'm going to do up here now is add some code. I'm going to say function validate. I'm going to indent this and add another curly brace here and another one here. Consider what this is now doing. I have now, think of this as created my own puzzle piece that didn't previously exist, and I've called this puzzle piece the validate puzzle piece. Its purpose in life is to execute the four lines of code inside of it. If document.getElementById. So conceptually, that is going to go into the document, get the element, the HTML element, whose unique ID is just Q, and then even though the syntax looks a little weird, that equal equals just means equals. So that means if the element with the unique identifier of Q, when gotten, has no value, it just equals quote unquote, nothing in there, then what do I want to do? I want to yell at the user. And, and we won't go into great detail here, I'm going to return false. That is an error. Else, I'm going to return true. So either it worked or it didn't, false or true. And now, if I didn't make any mistakes, let me save this and reload this. And let me just double check that I didn't, in fact, make any typos so I don't embarrass myself. Well, let's see if this works. So now I'm going to type cats. Still works. So half works, at least. Now let me reload it. And now let me try submitting without typing anything. Damn it, broke. <laughs> um, one moment. Let me open the console, the queries log, reload the page. Let me try this again. Oh, damn it. I, forgot. I made a typo. I remember what it is. Dot value. I meant to say if the value of the element whose ID is Q equals that, then yell at the user. So now let me hold my breath again. Here we go. There we go. Please type a query. So it's not letting me through. I can be kind of playful with this, and instead of checking for no value, I can say something like, uh, no more searching for cats. And now we can just more playfully let the user search for dogs if he or she wants. Or if I go in here and search for cats, it's now I can't. So what's the takeaway here? So one, we've introduced into our world of HTML and CSS programming functionality. I can actually now make decisions in code. Previously, all I could do is mark up textual content or graphical content and tell it what to look like and where to display. Now I can actually ask questions of the web page and make decisions based on it and prompt the user if I need to yell at him or her. So let's try something 
on our own with this. Go ahead, let me open up the next slide here and just point out one thing. Just like with CSS, we can factor out our JavaScript code to a separate file. You can do the same thing with JavaScript as with CSS. And you use that doing, using a source attribute of the script tag, but we won't complicate things for now. Instead, if you could, go to, not this page, but let me move this around in order. Go to, if you could, this page here. This URL here. It's in today's slides. You might have to reload because I've added a couple of things. But go there where some puzzles await. And this will give us a chance in a slightly more fun context to dabble with some JavaScript. And when you get there, I'll show you, I'll explain what awaits. Uh, Green. Set blue. Set green. Set red. Oops, sorry. This is the extent of our documentation for this challenge. And this is going to work as follows. So what you have on this page is a whole bunch of image puzzles by a buddy at, uh, at Stanford University. So what you're seeing here is almost kind of one of those magic eye puzzles. But if you just stare at it, nothing's going to pop out at you. Rather, something is hidden in this image. And it's hidden in the following way. Images, as you may know, can be composed of just three colors, some red, some blue, and some green. And we can make all the colors in the rainbow by mixing those three colors somehow. So this looks mostly green and blue. But as Nick says here, this iron puzzle image is a puzzle. It contains an image of something famous. However, the image has been distorted. The famous object is in the red values. However, the red values have all been divided by 10. So they are too small by a factor of 10. So in other words, Nick took an original image and he desaturated all of the red from it, lowering the amount of red ink, if you will, in it. The blue and green values are all just meaningless random values, aka noise designed to obscure the real image. So what Nick did was he toned down the red, and then he just threw random amounts of blue and green at the image to kind of obscure what's actually still there. You must undo these distortions to reveal the image. Uh, first, set all the blue and green values to 0 to get them out of the way, and look at the result. Then multiply each red value by 10, scaling back up to approximately its final value. What is the famous object? So all of you have this rectangle in your browser right now. And notice that there is some starter code, so to speak. This is JavaScript code that Nick has written for you. And notice that there's a, highlight, or there's a line in the middle that starts with a slash slash. That's what's generally called a comment. It means it's an, a, a phrase to the programmer that has no functional meaning. It's just a visual cue to the human. So you can go ahead and delete just that line and be super careful not to delete or change anything else. And let me just walk you through what this code does. And I'll leave it to you to uh, figure out the secret image. This first line here that I've just highlighted gives you the following. On the left-hand side, you have what's called a variable that Nick has arbitrarily but reasonably called im for image. On the right-hand side of that equal sign, he's saying, give me a new, quote unquote, simple image. Simple image, in this context, is what's called a class. Well, it's kind of like a class, technically a prototype. Um, but really, this is giving me a new object, the contents of which are the file ironpuzzle.ping. In other words, Nick has created this this notion of a simple image so that we can, for pedagogical purposes, play with the image and change its red, green, and blue values. And how are we doing that? This somewhat cryptic syntax here is kind of like the repeat block that some of you saw in Scratch earlier today, where you can repeat 10 times. In this case, Nick has not hard-coded a number like 10. Instead, he is saying, 
initialize a variable called x to 0, check if x is less than the width of the image, and so to be more proper, image is the variable, dot means go inside of it and get its width, and then open paren, close paren is just a programmer's way of saying this is a function, this is a procedure, this is functionality someone else wrote, use it and give me back an answer. And then x++ is a fancy way of saying after you've done this once, increment x by 1. In other words, this is a programmer's way of inducing a loop that's going to iterate over all of the, uh, uh, all of the columns in an image. An image is just a grid of dots, rows and columns of dots. This is a way of iterating over all of those columns. And on the inside, meanwhile, we're iterating over the height here and here and here. So this is just a way of traipsing, almost like an old school typewriter, to just go over the whole image iteratively. Even if that's, that's not quite wholly clear, just take on faith for now that those three lines of code together are going to allow you to iteratively look at every pixel, every dot in the image. What's a pixel? Well, to be clear, if we look at the original and zoom in, if you really put your eyes to the computer screen, that's just a whole bunch of dots, several thousand dots packed together there. And so, what are you about to do? Each one of those dots, a final definition, is the result of what's generally called RGB, uh, red, green, blue, which again can, can be combined to give you any number of colors. In fact, if, you're, uh, if you remember from many, many years ago, projector screens like these things used to have not one lens, but three. One of them spit out red light, one of them spit out green light, one of them spit out blue light. And if you were in a middle school like I was, where they were never properly aligned, you were always watching like history movies like that were slightly distorted because the three colors were not combining properly. But it turns out that each of these values, red, green, and blue, can have a number associated with them. For instance, 0 for red means no red, 0 for green means no green, and 0 for blue means no blue. So if you have no red, no green, and no blue, what color do you have? White. You would hope so, it's white. Unfortunately, this operates, um, sorry? Black. So you actually have black in this case. So if you have none of these colors turned on, you have black. However, if you have, let's say, a lot of them, like a lot of red, 255 of it, a lot of green, and a lot of blue, that is white. So these are the two extremes. So by this logic, if I have a lot of red and no green and no blue, what color is that? Right, obviously. And then no red, a lot of green, no blue. And then if you have, well, we'll just finish it just because, but this, of course, now is blue. And now you can combine these colors. Now, as an aside, if any of you have ever done some actual website design, you might actually see symbols like this, F, F, F. Um, and actually, it's probably not even that. It's F, 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 F. Anyone ever seen Fs and Es and A through A? So it turns out we talked today, yesterday about decimal and today kind of about decimal. Today we talked about binary. Turns out hexadecimal is a very common base system to use in computing. Uh, binary is 2. Decimal is 10. Hex is 16, and it turns out how do you count to six, how do you count in hexadecimal? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Mm. What do you use after 9? What's, what's the next number? Where do you use 0? I need 16 of these. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You know, you need some arbitrary convention, and what mankind decided some time ago that after 9 comes the letter A, and then B, and then C. So the way you count in hexadecimal is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, and that will count you all the way, it turns out, to 15. So 0 to 15 is 0 through F. Now why is that significant? Well, when you have two Fs, that's how you express 255. So long story short, in the world of Photoshop, that graphic design software in the world of web development where you have lots of colors of course to play with often programmers will express those in hexadecimal just because it's uh, it tends to be a little simpler even though at first glance it's much more complex so in any case this is important because Nick at Stanford has given us six pieces of functionality that you the budding programmers will now have the ability to use built into this web page is six functions six procedures that Nick wrote 
Three of them will get you a number, a red, a green, or a blue value. Three of them will set that value. But, and these underscores are just placeholders. So you need to know what those are. So with these three functions, the first of these things is going to be an x coordinate, and the second of these things is going to be a y coordinate. In other words, which dot, which pixel do you want to get the green of, get the blue of, get the red of? And then here, this is going to be x, this is going to be a y value, and this is going to be a number. So let's do the first line of this together, and then I'll leave it to you to try to deduce the rest. So per the instructions on this page, we need to increase the red by a factor of 10, and we need to remove the green and remove the blue. Let's start with the latter scenarios. So if I want to, and I'm going to indent by using some spaces, if I want to get the, set the red, the green, or the blue value, I'm going to do the following. Image, I am, dot set blue. And then based on my instructions here, what three things should I type inside of parentheses now? I need the x value, the y value, and what number should I put here if I want to get rid of the blue based on this story here? Just zero. If I want no blue, I'm just going to change it to zero. Now let's just recap what this is doing. I have here on these top, whoops, I have here on these top second and third lines, I claimed two loops, nested loops, if you will, that are going to have the effect of progressing from left to right, top to bottom, over all of the x values and all of the y values. Because again, a picture is just a ro uh, grid of rows and columns. So this is going to get rid of all the blue. Let me leave the next line to you. How do I get rid of all the green? Nice. Nice. And I'm going to zoom out. And just make take care that you've not done any typos. And if you're comfortable with what you've done, go ahead and click the button run slash save and see what you get. And again, we've made just three changes. We deleted that first comment and we replaced it with these two lines of code. And it's OK if you need to hit the run save button a couple times to fix something. And let me, I'll, I'll zoom in on my code so you can transcribe. Good. So I see Andrew has what seems to be a mistake. He's just got a big black rectangle on his screen. Does anyone else have a big black rectangle? Yeah. Big black rectangle? OK, so let's think about what this means. We said that 0, 0, 0, so no green, no red, re no blue, is going to give you black. And it turns out that most of, you, most of our laptops just don't have enough fidelity. You can't quite tell. There is actually something there. And if you kind of maybe re lean your screen forward and back, maybe do you see a little something there? Maybe, kind of, sort of? It's not perfectly black. There <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> there is some red there. But remember from the specifications of the problem, Nick toned it down. He desaturated it somewhat, but not all the way to zero. So if we want to magnify the amount of red, let me propose this trick. Let me zoom in on my screen. And let me go ahead and say amount equals im dot get red at xy. This line of code is giving me something called a variable. I have arbitrarily, but arguably reasonably, called my variable what, apparently? Amount. Right? Just amount. I could have called it anything I want. But I'm using this other function that I described earlier to get the number the amount of red at x comma y. Why did I do that? What do you want to do here? You need to add, yeah, so maybe multiply it by 10. And if you don't know this, I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to go ahead and say, you know what? I want the amount of red I want to be whatever is at the red times 10. And the star, the asterisk on your keyboard is the, don't use x, use the star. That's how you multiply things in most programming languages. So according to Kareem's intuition, stored in this variable called amount is how much red I want at location x, y. How now do I make that pixel have that number? You've already done this before. You set the green and the blue to no value, to 0. 
Yeah, so well, you don't want it to 10. You already did the math here, right? So we are getting the value of red, which is a low number, presumably. We're multiplying it by 10. What do you want to do with the variable amount now? Nice. So image dot set what? Set red. Set red at location x, y. Yeah, and just amount. In other words, a variable is a temporary placeholder that you can put anything you want in. We happen to be putting a number in it at the moment. We've multiplied it by 10 to make it bigger. And now I'm substituting that variable as that third argument or input to set red. And so that once you finish that, and keep my, take note of the, the semicolons and the parentheses, go ahead and click Run Save again. And you should see magically what was actually there. Arwa, what's there? The Eiffel Tower in full-fledged red. Not quite dark. It should, be, it should be more obvious now, yes? OK. And Andrew, no more black box? All right. So I'll, let me, I'll keep this on the screen. If you want to play with this later, I'll, I'll recreate this for you. But this code here did exactly that. Why don't we do one other? Let me scroll down slightly. So in this case, the projector doesn't really do it justice. But on your screens, you probably have a very red and very black box. This, too, is a puzzle. It shows something famous. However, the image has been distorted. The true image this time is in the blue and green values. However, they've all been divided by 20, so the values are very small. The red values are just random numbers, noise. Undo these distortions to reveal the true image. So in other words, Nick then tells you what to do. Set the red values to 0, and then don't, don't spoil what it is. Then multiply the blue and green values by 20. So it's almost the same program as before. But you're reversing the process. And I will put my code from before on the screen in case you want to refer back to it or play further with that one. Let me zoom in on that. But solve copper image puzzle number two. OK, so let me, this one I'm not going to give as many hints. So I would, what I, oh, let's see, you have a typo here. So remember, this here actually needs to go there. So what I would propose, if you want to focus on this one, there's the answer. If you want to transcribe that, okay. that should get the first one working. Okay. And then you can use that as inspiration for the second one. Nice. Good. And for the curious, this is a simple example of a, a science or an art called steganography, the art of hiding information in images. Um, typically, images might be watermarked very blatantly with like a logo in the bottom corner. But clearly, you can be much more sophisticated about it and actually hide other images in images somehow with this technique. Take another 30 seconds, and then we'll at least announce what you should see. And I'll leave the third one as an at-home exercise if you'd like more of a challenge this weekend. All right, and I think Andrew might have gotten it first. What, what is the second image, Andrew? Statue of Liberty will be the answer this time. So again, just some simple examples, the goal of which is to give you a sense of how we've kind of translated pictorial scratch blocks to more annoying and more sort of complicated code, but all of the ideas are still exactly the same, albeit with the introduction now of the notion of a variable, being able to store something temporarily. Well, let's do one more hands-on just to now connect the dots to something a little more real world. When you're ready, if you could go to this URL on the screen, that's also in your copy of the slides, developers.google.com slash maps. Let's actually do something real, so to speak, on the web using the Google Maps API or application programming interface in the following way. Google, like many companies, provides a lot of free functionality that you can use to build your own interesting applications. In fact, if you've ever used Uber, 
uh, to get a cab or a car. You probably know that Uber has a map and it shows cars on it. That is, as best I can tell, Google Maps API. They are actually using Google's maps, but Uber is not a mapping company, nor would that be a particularly interesting problem to solve on top of their car service problem. And so they're standing, again, on the shoulders of all others, Google in this case. So they use Google's maps, but their own car services and other such features. So we are going to take advantage of this to do the following. And if I've gone too fast, just call me over in a moment. Happy to recap some of that other, the image stuff. You should see yourself at a page like this. So Google's nice, and they're among the best at providing not only APIs, but free APIs that you can play with or use commercially. They do start charging you if your usage is high, but I went ahead in advance and signed us up for a free account that hopefully uh, 10 computers won't uh, disqualify us for suddenly. So hopefully this demonstration will work. And notice that they have APIs for Android, iOS, web, and web services, whatever that is. Let's focus on web. So click the, perp, uh, the pink box, web, and that will lead you, hopefully, to a page here. And they've got a whole bunch of APIs. And it can be a little overwhelming at first, but I'll steer us through what we want. At the top left is the Google Maps JavaScript API, the JavaScript API. So go ahead and click that one. And that will lead you now to uh, the following page. Demos and sample code. Let me zoom out here and let me get us to scroll down to where it says quick start steps. It, your screen should look like mine and there's two steps. Get a key and start developing. I already did step one for us, getting a so-called key. And this is a common idea. An API key is generally just a big random number or string that you are supposed to paste into your code so that Google knows who you are when you're using their service, their API doesn't mean we're being charged anything. And now click, instead of one, click Start Developing, if you could. And just wave me over if not sure where we are. So we'll just scratch the surface here. But what I thought would be compelling is to actually have all of us using Cloud9 in one window and this tutorial in another window. Let's actually get our own web application up and running that embeds a custom Google map in our own web page and then adds one or two features. But we'll just scratch the surface of what we can do. So just a quick sanity check. Is everyone at this page, Google Maps JavaScript API? Should say getting started. We're not going to go through the whole thing by any means. OK. In another tab, if you don't have it open, do go into Cloud9 and get yourself to just a new tab ultimately. So again, c9.io from yesterday. c9.io. And just create a new file. And go ahead and call it whatever you'd like. I called mine map. .html, call it anything ending in .html. And you should be roughly where I am in this process with just a blinking prompt in an empty tab called something like map.html. Yep, or file, new file this time. And now, over on the Google Maps JavaScript API, we'll skip reading through all of this text. But notice that Hello World is indeed everywhere. You see it now. Hello World has this big colorful example of a whole bunch of HTML. Go ahead and copy and paste only that HTML. So from the doc type at the top all the way to the close HTML tag, go ahead and copy all of that. Again, that's under the Hello World example and paste that into your Cloud9 tab so that now your screen should look roughly like mine. And you can save it, but don't load it just yet. Let's first look at the code and see if we can't infer or learn from what it is Google has had us blindly copy and paste. They just want to help literally get us started. But there's not that much complexity actually there. Any questions just yet? We're safe to forge ahead? OK. So real quickly, let's just do some quick sanity checks. Line one of what I see, and hopefully you see, what does that mean? Doc type HTML. Kareem, recall? HTML5. Yes, here comes HTML5. Meanwhile, line two on the screen here means, hey, browser, here comes the actual HTML. Line three is, hey, browser, here comes the head. Line four is, of course, hey, browser, here comes the title. What does line five do? Actually. This doesn't really do anything for us in this case. It just resizes the page to a default. 
Uh, line six we have not talked about, but it specifies the character encoding. There's different ways to encode files, especially for foreign languages. UTF-8 just tends to be the default. So now we'll see in line seven through 16, some CSS. And even though we've not seen all of these things before, we can kind of infer. So line eight means, hey browser, apply ev all of the following to which two tags, apparently? The HTML and body tag. So the comma is the new thing there. And that's just a way of specifying multiple tags at once. Then we've got the curly braces. So apparently, this tells the browser, make the height of the page 100%. So even if there's very little content, make the whole page, make the thing fill the page. Make the map ultimately fill the page. Margin, what does that mean? That's usually like arbitrary white space around the edges that some browser designer just decided should be there because it kind of makes things look cleaner. But we don't want that. We want the map going all the way to the edges. Padding, similar in spirit to margins. Margins mean outside, padding means inside, but it's the same kind of D. It's a little bit of a buffer between you and the edges. And then line 13 is a good chance for a quick review. What does sharp sign map mean? Or hashtag map mean? What does that refer to in principle? Exactly. This property, this CSS property applies to just one thing, the HTML tag that has an ID of quote unquote map. And now let's fast forward, scroll down to the bottom of the file, which isn't too far away, and notice on line 19, if you paste it exactly like I did, line 19 has just a div, which is a division of the page, which yesterday I called a rectangular region. It's got nothing in it, it's an open tag, closed tag, but it does have a unique ID. So what seems to be happening here is Google is readying our web page to have a complete 100% height and no padding, no margins. Because what we're going to put inside of this div, whose unique ID is map, is an actual embedded map. And we want it to fill the page and not just be some small rectangle in the middle. So line 14 similarly emphasizes the map itself should have a height of 100%. So now notice between lines 20 and 28, this is JavaScript code. And this is, even though it's syntactically a little strange, there's not all that much going on here. In line 21, this is declaring something called a variable. Instead of calling it amount, like we did before, we're more precisely saying var, which just means variable. We could have used that in Nick's code, but he didn't, so I didn't bother doing it either. It's a variable called map. And then there's a function that's apparently called init map. So this is like our own custom puzzle piece in Scratch. We've created a piece of functionality called init map. And you can kind of infer what's going on here. On the left-hand side, we've got a variable, so we're going to put the following thing inside that variable from right to left. The right-hand side says, hey, browser, give me a new Google map. And google.maps.map is just a funky way of specifying that this functionality belongs to Google, uh, Google Maps. After the parenthesis, we've seen this before. Hey, browser, get me the element in the page, the tag in the page, whose unique ID is map. And what is going on? Well, this line together, line 23, is essentially saying, hey, browser, go get me that empty div on the page whose unique ID is map, because I want to insert into it, inject into it, if you will, a whole bunch of content that happens to be coming from the web subsequently. And Google's doing all of that for us. So again, at the very end of the day, we have this example of abstraction. I have no idea what a map is or how to implement a map API. We don't need to. We just need to tell the map where to put itself and leave those underlying implementation details to Google. Now, there's apparently two pieces of data that this example is providing to Google's API. Apparently, the center of the map and the zoom level, so to speak. And does anyone recognize these GPS coordinates, latitude and longitude? Probably not, but we can cheat and go back to the tutorial. You don't literally see it, but we'll see it in just a moment. Zoom level is a value between, I don't know, like 1 and 13 or something like that. It just has to do with how far you're zoomed in or out. And that's it. And now at the very end of the page, notice line 29. It's a little ugly because it wraps. This line of code is what downloads to the browser Google's actual API, all of the code that Google's engineers have written that implement this whole feature of embeddable maps. Now let's not change anything. If you're following along, go ahead and just save that file if you indeed have what I have. Go to its URL. You can click the Run button up top, and that will tell you the URL of your web server again. And it will lead you to a new tab. If you click Open, 
for map.html, and odds are you're going to get an alert, an error message. Yes? Error message, error message. So unfortunately, the error message is not that enlightening unless you actually open the console, that special tab we kept opening yesterday and a little bit earlier today. But I stumbled across this earlier, so I already figured out what the solution is. In today's slides, or rather in Cloud9, notice that we didn't do something deliberately. Notice that this script tag on line 29, if you read through it, it's like maps.googleapis.com slash something, something, something. Then notice someone, one of the developers wrote in all capital letters, your API key. That's, we need to paste something in there. And this was the step I did for us before. And again, they might blacklist us if suddenly 12 or more of us start using the same key. But let's see what happens. So if you go into today's slides, one slide later, there's this very funky looking string of text. Go ahead and just copy that and paste it where it says your API key. That's the one I signed us up for. And definitely don't try typing it out manually because this feels fraught with typos, potentially. So just copy and paste that. And it's going to make the line longer. But now, just to be clear, it should look a little more like this, where key equals not capitalized yelling at you. Save your page. Go back to the other tab, reload. And you hopefully see a map of where? Australia. So apparently those are the GPS coordinates of Australia. And let me walk around for just a moment and help anyone who's not quite there. But let me propose via Google, find the GPS coordinates of your own hometown or your own home country. And probably Google can turn this up or Wikipedia can tell you. But choose two different values for latitude and longitude. Go back in and paste them and then reload the page after saving and see if you can have a map for your own hometown. And when you're done with that, the follow-up challenge, and I'll give a little less direction deliberately so that you deliberately have to struggle for a couple minutes with the documentation, change the map to be not this cartoonish default, but a satellite map. So you actually see satellite imagery instead of the pretty colors. And the hint I'll give you is change the map's type. And go back to that getting started page for inspiration. As you may have gleaned, if you're looking, there's so many more things you can do. Some of you have already changed the map type, but you can do, for instance, let me go to something we did for the course I teach, maps.cs50.net. One of our undergrads did this. We center our map over Harvard Yard and overlay all of these building names. And we had him add this. So if I want to search for, for instance, Matthews Hall, we have a little drop down menu, and I think he's using Bootstrap, the library we discussed earlier for this. And if you click on Matthews Hall, it immediately jumps the map to a certain location, and it shows you a picture and this little pop up. But even this little pop up we didn't implement. If I scroll down on our Getting Started page and look for Info Windows, you'll see that some of the functionality you yourself can add, albeit with a bit more complexity, is something called an in Info Window. And if I click an example here, and this is what's fun, you can do things like this, clicking on a marker, and then voila, information pops up. So we haven't quite introduced enough features of JavaScript to paint a picture of exactly how you could wire all of this stuff together. But we've kind of scratched the surface. In fact, what I just did when I clicked on that marker was triggering an event, a so-called on-click event. And we actually saw an event earlier today, the so-called on-submit event, when we were preventing the user from searching for cats. So we've kind of picked and choose from among all of these various features to give you a sense, hopefully, of what you can actually do with a bit more comfort in programming and completely free resources. Any questions? No? This is your final chance, at least today on a Friday, to get anything off your chest so that you walk out of here feeling confident and comfortable. Yes? Why don't you add one more bit? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I need to rest this weekend, I think. <laughs> Other questions? The script tag in the HTML tag, do, can we only put JavaScript? Or? You can in Internet Explorer, rest in peace, you used to be able to put VB script, virtual basic script, but that really never caught on. So the short answer is just JavaScript. Other questions? No? 
All right, well, let me do this. Let me grab our uh, colleagues outside. Uh, they have some evaluation forms that they want. I'd love everyone to spend a few minutes filling out. Uh, they want to collect that form and any waivers that you might have outside. They'll also have certificates. I'm guessing there's still some snacks outside. Uh, but let me pass these out. And if you have any questions in the meantime, I'll walk around more individually and we can get you started. Yes, of course. Uh, that's usually true these days. Certainly with web software, you are leaning on others. You're either aesthetically using things like Bootstrap, so you don't have to implement the low-level details of like menus and buttons and all that. You're leaning on someone like Google so that you don't have to build an Uber business and a mapping business and any number of similar applications as well. In fact, logins are popular too. If you've used Spotify or any number of websites, you'll log into some websites using Facebook. So what's nice, there is there are APIs for logins nowadays so that you don't have to have your own users table and all of your own database necessarily to the same extent, you can let Facebook do all of that complexity for you. So it's an exciting time, honestly, in programming because there's so many third-party services that you can build on top of. And again, the pr a price you pay is either financial or downtime. If Google goes down, so does Uber, arguably. But perhaps that's a reasonable trade-off. And again, that was one of the themes, hopefully, for the past couple of days is these trade-offs. And rarely is there going to be a right answer. It really is the better of two or more answers. Let me pass these around. There we go. And these Cloud9 accounts will continue to work in theory in perpetuity. Um, you might find if you wait a few days or a week or more to log back into them, it might take like four, uh, one or five minutes to open back up, but that's just because they put it to sleep to save on resources.